continue where we left off. Remember, we were discussing uh, mostly about how a converging, diverging nozzle works, and then we looked at this under and over expansion. We'll now get into some of the equations. And as we discussed, uh, to derive these, you need to have uh, you know, some background in compressible flow. Uh, if you're taking a compressible flow course, this won't be in trouble for you. And, and if you're interested, you can look at the appendix, but we're not going to assume that. We're just going to look at just the equations and try to uh, interpret them and show how we can use them to size the, uh, the nozzle, the, the, the engine here. <clears throat> so uh, here's a depiction. Uh, I'm just going to use some nom nomenclature of the nozzle that we're going to try to size. Um, we're going to use, uh, we, we're, we're mainly going to be talking about after combustion anyway. So here Q, this is, means this is not dynamic pressure, this is heat. So there's going to be a lot of heat. Um, we're not going to focus on that combustion process, but after, right after combustion chamber, C, we'll label uh, that portion C. T is the throat and E is the exit. So it's going to be mainly this part of the nozzle that we're going to be interested in. This part is not really critical for the flow in terms of the shape, but uh, is important to you know, from a chemical reaction standpoint. Um, but for us, you know, we're not going to focus on the chemistry, so we're going to assume that the pressure and temperature of combustion are going to be inputs to our problem. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is to compute the velocity at the exit, V sub E. So this is uh, the exit velocity. Um, it's a function of the type of repellent, gamma, right? And these, this is also, this is a universal constant. Remember, this is a molecular weight of propellant. So these are all related to the repellents. Tc, that's the temperature and combustion. Pc is the pressure in the combustion chamber. And then Pe is the exit pressure. And that's usually going to be pretty close to our atmospheric pressure. Um, in the ideal case, right, if we design for that, remember we talked about uh, here, where we're ideally expanded, they will be equal, but in general, they're not necessarily equal. But for the ideal expansion case, PE is P infinity. Um, and, and once you're, you know, well out of the atmosphere, or most of the atmosphere, then that's going to become really small, right? Go to zero. So this term here generally does not contribute much. So the biggest factors in terms of achieving a high exit velocity is a high combustion temperature. Um, that's going to make this bigger, and then small molecular weights, right? That will, since that's in the denominator, that's also going to increase this. So we would like a propellant and a combustion that happens at <clears throat> high temperatures and low weights. Um, this is a disadvantage for solid rockets. They generally don't burn as hot, and their products are heavier. So the exit velocity is smaller. They make that up somewhat, because remember that thrust is the mass flow rate times the exit velocity plus the pressure term, but this is the biggest term. So for a solid rocket, the exit velocity is smaller, but it makes up for it somewhat because uh, there's a higher mass flow rate um, you know, with a solid propellant. However, in general still, um, solid rockets tend to be a bit less efficient than liquid rockets. Okay, so this is exit velocity. So again, if we know what happens after combustion and we know the type of propellants we're using, we can compute our exit velocity. So next, we're going to look at the throat size. So remember what that is, that's the smallest point. So we're going to size how much area do I need? And that's going to be dictated by this mass flow rate. OK, so if I know how much mass flow rate, so if I've got a given propellant, um, I, I can figure out the burn rate. That's going to be related to how, how much I'm, I'm burning in the combustion chamber. So I've got this mass flow rate. I need to size my area so that it is large enough to accommodate that mass flow rate. And again, you can see it's going to depend on our combustion pressure, temperature, and the type of repellents. Okay, so fairly straightforward to do once we have those things. So this can help us size uh, the area that we need in the throat. Okay, well, uh, from sizing the throat, we're now going to size going back to how big, how much area do we need to start this nozzle? We call this the, com the combustion area size, because normally this is going to be a constant cross section area. So going from the start here to the throat, we want to size that area ratio. So in this plot here on the right, what we are looking at is the ratio of that area. How much bigger is that combustion relative to the throat? Of course, it has to be bigger, right? The throat is the minimum area point. So how much bigger is it? 
Um, and on the y-axis, we're looking at what's called the total pressure ratio. <clears throat> so this is the total pressure from the front or from the combustion to the throat. From an undergraduate fluids class, you may remember total pressure as being a sum of the static pressure and the dynamic pressure. That's not true for a compressible flow. It's a little more complex, but it's a similar idea. It's the pressure that we would get if we took the flow to a stagnation. And in this case, we would take it isentropically, but you could think of it conceptually similar. It's how much pressure would exist if the flow were uh, at a stagnation no longer moving. So ideally, we want the total pressure ratio to be one, meaning the total pressure ratio here is exactly the same as the total pressure ratio here. If it's less than one, that means that uh, we have lost some work, some potential work that's irrecoverable. So it's an irreversible process. Or in other words, we increase entropy, is gonna happen from losses of, of drag, things in the boundary layer, um, fluid is, um, as the fluid moves from here and so on. So anything that's less than one is not ideal. That means we're gonna be less efficient. We've lost some potential to produce thrust. So as you can see, that as we make the area ratio bigger and bigger, we approach one. So that's great. We would love to make the area bigger. But in all things, of course, there are trade-offs uh, almost always, right? So what, what's the trade-off here? Why don't we wanna make this really large? Well, if this is really large, right? We've made the combustion area Larger, that means our whole combustion chamber is gonna be bigger. And so that's gonna add more structure, more weight. The rocket is gonna to have to become bigger too to fit that in, so we have more drag from that. So there's a, a balance, right? That we wanna go as far to the right as we can, but we don't wanna to have too much weight. And uh, practically speaking, most rockets uh, settle around three. They use an area ratio around three. So you can see that there's a very diminishing return. So if we push too close to one, We've lost a lot of potential work, um, but after we get to about three, it's pretty flat. And you can see these two curves are relatively insensitive to gamma, uh, the propellant. And, and 1.1, 1.6 covers a broad range propellants. That's, that's a pretty broad range. So it really doesn't, it really isn't affected by that. So this is almost a universal parameter that most rockets are gonna be around three, but the combustion area, the electric throat area is about three. Okay, so, We've sized the throat, what about the exit? <clears throat> so now we wanna look at the ratio of the exit area to the throat area. How big does that need to be? And this is perhaps the most important uh, parameter in sizing a rocket nozzle, so it's given its own symbol even, epsilon. Um, so on the, on the plot, we're looking at what that ratio looks like, and you can see already these numbers are much bigger as compared to the thrust coefficient. We can see that we would love, in this case, have uh, a smaller gamma, that's gonna be more desirable to have a propellant mixture with a smaller gamma. And that if we wanna get the thrust coefficient larger, we have to go quite a ways out here because the slope is not that steep. Um, so for reference, the space shuttle main engine has uh, an expansion ratio of about 77. So quite large, right? The ratio, so in other words, the ratio of the exit area is about 77 times bigger than the area of the throat. We can see a picture, here's, the, here's that engine, spatial main engine. You can't really quite see the throat, it's kind of hidden in these gases, but you can kind of get an idea from looking at the taper, uh, how small it is relative to that exit area. And so that's, that's an important parameter that we need to get that area uh, sized, you know, based on the amount of thrust that we need. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Well, um, it's kind of a two-step process. First, we can, based on the uh, exit pressure, we can compute what our Mach number at the exit is going to be. So um, often, in this case, so we can see here the combustion temperature plays a role, the type of propellant we're using. The exit pressure, we're going to generally size it um, around so that we get our best performance, um, you know, at uh, uh, just after max Q. So in that case, we're going to assume that we're at ideally, uh, ideally expanded, right, this case, going back here right here. So we'll take the pressure um, a little bit after max Q, plug that in, use P infinity here, so we can figure out the Mach number we're gonna get at the exit. And from that Mach number at the exit, we can then determine the area ratio we need. So we're sizing the area so that we can get the Mach number that we want, so that we can get the right pressure ratio that we need uh, to be ideally expanded 
um, at our design altitude. Okay, so that's the process. I know there's these equations, you know, they're kind of messy, and this is this is what happens in compressible flow. Um, but they're, you know, they, they only depend on a few things. Um, but yeah, they are they are a bit lengthy. Okay, so we've sized all the areas. Um, there's there's a lot of physics involved there, and and uh, and and this is predicts this works quite well. We've made actually several assumptions when we did this. Um, about isentropic flow, um, adiabat uh, well, that's part of isentropic, that's adiabatic. Uh, we've assumed, you know, no, no significant losses through a boundary layer, things like that. Uh, but this works quite well. These assumptions are not um, actually as limiting as they might seem. Uh, we even get quite good predictions, you know, usually within a few percent of, an, of, a, of the actual rocket, um, you know, with these type of equations. Sizing the lengths is a bit less satisfying. There's not as much physics here. It's more of rules of thumb and sort of guidance, uh, whereas these are based on, you know, mass balances, um, energy conservation, and so on. The lengths, though, are just going to be a little more rough, and, and they're not, they don't necessarily need to be quite as precise. Um, so here is just showing some depictions of some angles. Uh, it turn, this part here, this converging part, it's uh, the shape or I should say the, the performance is, is much less sensitive to the angle and the shape of this converging section. This is a very favorable uh, high acceleration portion and uh, you know, the exact contours are not super important. We, we do want a smooth contour, but the angle isn't really a, a big deal and they're generally gonna be around 60 degrees. The exit is more important that we have a good shape. Um, if this angle becomes too big, the flow will actually separate because right even though even though as we talked about with supersonic flows we're going to be accelerating around here if we go too steep it's not going to be able to maintain uh, that type of uh, shape and the flow will actually separate and that's of course going to lead to massive losses of thrust so we can't be too aggressive there um, and so this is the trade-off right we need to get this huge exit area right we're going from a small area to a big area so obviously if we get a big angle that's nice from a structure point of view. We don't need such a big engine. If we have a really shallow angle, it's going to take us a long time to get to the area we need. And so it's going to be a rather lengthy nozzle. But unfortunately, we just can't push it too much or else we're going to have um, uh, separation. We'll also have problems, as we see here. Um, this is derived in the text. But uh, basically, the bigger that angle has, the more uh, th this what's called the divergence factor drops below one. And this is not exactly, right? This is more a correction on your exit velocity, which is about a correction on your thrust. Uh, in other words, you're losing potential thrust, um, basically because uh, of the way the mass flow is going, right? We're, we're uh, directing more flow out at an angle here. So typically, um, you know, again, in all things, you've got to balance. We don't want to go too shallow, that's going to be better for our flow expansion. We're not going to have this big divergence factor, but then our rocket's going to be excessively heavy because we just have way too much length. So typically it's around 12 to 18 degrees, you know, 15 as we saw here is, um, oh, sorry, I didn't even, I wasn't even showing you the right slide. Um, 15 is somewhere in the middle. This is that plot of that divergence factor that I was talking about. So as that angle becomes bigger and bigger, we lose more and more potential thrust, really exit velocity, but basically thrust. After about 20 degrees is about where separation becomes a problem. So, you know, somewhere around 15 degrees, 12, 15 uh, is, is pretty typical. Okay, so um, this is just geometry then. If we know angles, right, we, we know these radiuses because we already figured out those areas and we know these angles. So from these formulas, we could figure out how long these need to be. Okay, and that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the last point here, though, is that we don't make nozzles with these conical shapes. That's just not effective. Um, we would really like uh, something more like this, what's called a bell-shaped nozzle. Um, that's going to help turn the flow more gradually and direct it so that it's more, uh, right, so the flow isn't coming out so much at an angle here, but as curved and is coming out straighter, right? And we would like that because that's going to be directing it in our thrust direction. If it's going at too much of an angle, 
and we've got a component in the thrust direction, but a component that's going to the side that's wasted. So we would like to um, redirect that better. So this is a particular shape, right? You can look it up if you're interested, but there's a particular uh, expression formula or uh, uh, profile for this uh, nozzle. We're not gonna worry about that, but the point here for us is that um, when one specifies as one of these uh, bell nozzles, uh, a convention is to uh, define the length relative to a, um, a conical nozzle that's at 15 degrees. So if I said I had 80% bell nozzle, that would mean that I would compute how long my nozzle would be for um, a 15 degree angle and 80% bell nozzle would have 80% of that length. And that length is from throat, right? Is throat to exit, okay? So in other words, again, if I know my area ratios, I just take those areas, figure out the length I would need, and then I multiply by 0 0.8 to get the length for the corresponding bell nozzle. Okay, one last thing, and that's um, talking about the combustion chamber, how to size it. Um, frankly, these are sized just based off of historical data, looking at um, similar designs, um, with similar propellants, but uh, an approach that's really not used that much anymore, but is, uh, has been used in the past, is to use what's called a mixing length. So if I have, um, here's my combustion chamber. Okay, oops, sorry, it's not very straight. Here's this combustion chamber and it's gonna narrow down, right? Here you go, but the, the volume, there's the volume of the combustion chamber. Um, and I'm going to have, uh, well, if we go back to one of these pictures, right, it's going to narrow down to the throat and go up. Okay. Okay, here's the combustion chamber again. Sorry. Throat. Okay, so here's the area of the throat. Um, this is the volume of the combustion chamber. Um, we can define what's called a mixing length. It just has units of length. And so it's given by the volume of the combustion chamber divided by the throat area. So this is just some characteristic length saying that um, uh, based on how much volume is in my combustion chamber, and I know eventually I'm gonna push it through this air, the throat area, which is gonna be my minimum area. Uh, I have this length that uh, um, could be used to compare between one design and another. And it really depends on the propellant. So it's not a universal number. This is why this is not super as useful anymore, but at this early stage design where we don't know about a similar rocket, it could still sometimes be used. And it's gonna be a number, say around 0.8 to three or so. It's not gonna be super sensitive. So we'll pick something here, but that'll help us to size. So, so in other words, what we would do here is we would choose L star, right? Let's say we just pick something in the middle. We say 1.5 is a, a typical number based on past design. So we have 1.5. We already know how to comp compute our throat area. So that gives us how much volume we need in our combustion chamber. And because we already computed the area of that combustion chamber, we can now compute this length, right? The length of the combustion chamber just by knowing the volume. Okay, again, that's not gonna be super satisfying. It's a bit rough, but it's not as critical as it is, for example, of getting these cross-sectional areas where these are really important and are based on um, you know, real physics and the mass and energy balances. Okay, well, uh, that was fairly quick. We're gonna have an assignment where we'll go through this and so hopefully it'll become a little bit clearer as we go through this, but uh, um, that's gonna be uh, it for propulsion. Uh, next time we're gonna talk about orbital mechanics as, we, um, as we've alluded to already. Uh, one of the key parameters in our rocket equation was this delta V term. And so we need to figure out how do we know what that should be, depending on the orbit I need to get to, or if I need to switch between different orbits, how do I figure out what that needs to be? And so we'll talk about, about that for the next two lectures. All right, have a good one.